Hey everyone. Uh, so if you remember from where we left off last week, we were talking about um, these computer vision problems that we can apply the machinery uh, that we learned uh, from classification to. And um, so this is uh, sort of the, the, the overview of the methods that we were talking about. Um, so we talked last class about semantic segmentation, um, which is where at a pixel level, um, you classify what each pixel contains. Like, so in this example, grass, cat, tree, sky, um, there is also localization, which is where an image has a single object. This is not a problem that will probably come up in practice for many of us, but it's important to understand it because it's sort of a subcomponent to more realistic problems. And then there's object detection where you're detecting boxes uh, for multiple objects in the same Im image. Um, and then finally instance segmentation, um, which is sort of like semantic segmentation in that you're classifying things at the pixel level, um, but you're classifying specific objects. And so in this example, if they're two dogs, uh, they're classified as two separate dogs. Um, and so just to kind of briefly recap what we talked about last Wednesday, um, we mentioned semantic segmentation and how kind of the general intuition for that is you take your image and you pass it through um, uh, your ConvNet. So, you know, for example, through BGG or through ResNet. Um, and now you have this um, image that's very rich um, in semantic information you know, it's very rich in kind of the features that you want to uncover, but it's low resolution. And you need to predict at the pixel level of your original image what each pixel is. And so essentially like the inside of this literature is that you can just take the same kind of CNN structure and stack it in reverse um, and use something we talked about called transpose com uh, convolution to take that dense uh, semantically rich feature space and project it back up um, to the full resolution where you can then uh, classify each pixel. Um, and, um, you know, so again, semantic segmentation is maybe something with kind of less applications to social science research than object detection, um, but kind of the, this intuition um, for, you know, being able to upsample rich information, rich semantic information from the final levels of your CNN is going to be something that we see um, come up elsewhere. Okay, so we were kind of very briefly going through localization at the end of class uh, last time. So I want to come back and touch on this again, just to make sure that we're all clear on it. Um, and so the definition of localization is there's only one object per image. Um, and we want to classify what kind of object is that? Is it a cat, a dog, a truck? Um, and determine the coordinates of its bounding box. Um, and um, so this is going to draw heavily on the machinery we already developed for classification, but it's going to add an additional fully connected layer at the end to predict um, object bounding box coordinates. Um, and so, in machine learning, we have, generally speaking, two types of problems. We have classification problems, which have discrete outputs. Um, and we already saw last Monday about the uh, different losses, like the, um, uh, the SVM and softmax losses um, that we use for uh, classification. Um, and then we also have regression, um, which is continuous outputs. And like the coordinates of a bounding box are continuous outputs. And so regression is used in essentially the same sense that we use it in economics. Um, you know, it's typically done with just a, a Euclidean loss. And so you have a prediction minus the ground truth squared, um, and you add those up um, to get your loss. Um, sometimes people will use other losses like a smooth bell one, um, but it's essentially uh, analogous. So when people say regression in deep learning, that's all they mean is that you have this loss function. And um, so recall the desired output from localization is a class um, and coordinates for that single object as it appears in the image. Um, and the first thing is just an image classification problem and we already know how to do that. Um, the second is a regression problem where we need to predict the four continuous numbers that make up the coordinates of that object's location in the image. And um, 
so recall, you know, we've seen in this class before um, the analogy that neural networks are just like Legos. We can stack them on top of each other and add different components depending on what we want to do. Um, and so in this context, we can take kind of our standard um, CNN backbone. So here this is showing um, Alex that in practice you would probably use um, you know, um, you would use something like ResNet. Um, and then you have a classification head on it, which is what we saw, you know, so far in the course when we're discussing classification, where you're trying to figure out if that's a cat or a dog or something else. Um, but you add another head um, or another fully connected layer um, to, um, to the end of the CNN backbone, um, which is predicting four numbers. Um, that's your box coordinates. And so in practice, you know, so um, let's say that the output from the final layer of your CNN can be written as this 4096 dimensional vector. Um, then for the classification, you have those fully connected weights to the thousand different class probabilities, right, which is a very large number of weights. And now in addition to that, you have a separate fully connected layer where you take those 4,096 um, output neurons um, from the final layer of your CNN and you connect that to the um, probabilities uh, for the four box coordinates. Um, and so this is what is called um, a um, multi-task loss. Um, and this comes up a lot. Um, and um, okay. So you just combine these two um, loss functions. Um, so essentially you add them up, you have a classification loss, say you do that with softmax and a regression loss, like an L2 loss. Um, sometimes you predict the boxes for all categories, but uh, you only apply the loss to the correct one. Uh, and um, in order to co combine these two losses together, you need a hyperparameter that tells you um, how to weight them together. You know, do you take them and weight them? Equally, what's that on um, what's that weight? So in practice, this is a hyperparameter that you need to choose. Um, and the only thing to be aware of is that like if you change that hyperparameter, it changes like essentially the units of your loss. Um, and so you can't evaluate this hyperparameter using the value of the loss, which is something that you'd often do when evaluating other hyperparameters, is you check the loss. Um, you know, at the end of, of your training. Um, but obviously, if you're changing the scale of the loss, then you can't do that. You need to evaluate this hyperparameter based on something like um, accuracy or some other metric that's not directly the value of the loss. Okay, so that's localization. Um, now I want to move on to talking about object detection, uh, which is a problem um, that kind of comes up frequently, um, you know, or, or that. Like I should say that, that, that it's an area that has enormous potential um, for social science applications. Okay, and so the first question you might have is, well, can we just approach um, object detection as if this was a localization problem? Um, and the challenge here is that, um, so can we treat um, object detection as localization? Um, and so the reason why the, this isn't gonna work is that um, the fully connected layers, um, like at the end of our CNN, output a fixed number of outputs. Um, but with object detection, we don't know how many objects there's going to be ex ante. So we don't know how many classes, um, we don't know how many coordinate bounding boxes um, that we're going to need. And so that's not going to work because um, the um, Network structure localization um, can only output a fixed number of boxes. Um, and so, you know, one approach would just be to take many different crops of the image, just using a sliding window, and then apply, um, uh, you know, and then classify each crop as class or background. And if it is an object class, then treat it as a localization problem and estimate the coordinates of the object in that. Um, and so this is something that is not, you know, is not going to work in practice um, because, um, you know, our 
like a CNN has many layers, like in the case of say ResNet 101, you're passing this through, you know, 101 layers. Um, that's very time consuming, computationally, very compute intensive to do. And so if you wanted to just take this brute force approach, you need to, in any given image, there'd be a huge number of locations, of aspect ratios and scales. Um, and you would take all of those and pass them through the CNN. And so in practice, nobody does this. Maybe people did something like a little bit like this in like kind of pre-deep learning days where you didn't have to pass everything through this kind of deep CNN, but just in practice, randomly cropping an image and seeing if there's an object there and then treating it like a localization uh, problem with just one object is not going to work. Um, what people did instead initially was to use traditional uh, traditional image processing tools, so not deep learning based, to propose a given number of regions where objects might be present. And so this is showing an example of something that's called selective search. Um, and this particular method is looking for around 2000 um, potential regions where an object might be present. And the details of how they do this aren't important. Um, but essentially, it's kind of looking for these blobby like uh, regions in an image that could um, be an object. It doesn't take too long to run the selective search algorithm, maybe like a couple of seconds per image. And then, you know, passing, you've at least limited the number of um, crops that you have to pass through your CNN to something like um, 2000. Um, and so this is called um, region CNN. Um, and the general idea is that we crop using the selective search boxes. And then we need to warp that um, because the fully connected layers at the end are gonna assume a fixed input size. Um, and we run it through the CNN, these fixed sized images, and then use at the end of our CNN, we have the classifier head to predict um, whether or not there's an object there, or if it's not any of the objects specified to predict that it's background. Um, and a regression to predict um, a correction to the bounding box. And so you have these initial kind of proposal bounding boxes, but those might not be quite correct, right? And so this regression head predicts a delta on those coordinates to shift kind of those um, boxes around um, in order to improve the match with the ground truth. And always like, you know, these methods are always highly supervised. Do you know what the ground truth is in training and you're trying to kind of match the predictions to the ground truth. Um, and so your loss for the regression is between the ground truth and the shifted coordinates uh, from that original, that takes the coordinates of the original proposal from selective search and shifts them. Okay, and so this is kind of a very um, intuitive approach, um, but unfortunately there are some problems with it. Um, so first of all, it's slow to train. Um, in the paper, they said it took 84 hours. Um, another problem is it takes a lot of disk space because it saves the region proposals to disk. Um, there's some other issues. The training is kind of the way they do it in the paper, the training's a bit ad hoc. Um, and um, importantly, inference is also really slow um, because um, for each image that you want to process, you're going to take you know uh, two thousand forward passes to do the inference um, because um, there's two thousand proposals. So at test time or when you want to scale this up, it's going to be very very slow. Um, and so let's say you want to run this on like, you know, 10 million images, like that's not going to work um, at 47 seconds per image. And I bet that 47 seconds per image is on a pretty fast computer, um, not on like, you know, a cheap CPU that you would run in the cloud um, to kind of run this at scale. And so that, that's going to be a problem. Um, and so the kind of the similar authors had a solution to these challenges in a paper that they called Fast RCNN, right? Which, um, good title. The first one was Region CNN, and this is Fast RCNN because it's going to be faster. Um, and so how do they make it faster? Um, and so the insight um, in this work is that 
rather than running every region proposal separately through the ComNet, you can just reuse the convolutional features map, which is expensive to compute across the entire image. And so essentially you have your input image and you do selective search on that. But then rather than cropping at that stage and passing each of the crops through the ComNet, you project um, those crops down on um, to the um, final layer of the ComNet. Um, and then those become your regions of interest. And then you do something like ROI pooling to get the fixed size that you need for those fully connected layers. And then you do your softmax classifier and your bounding box regression. And so essentially this is like um, the re original region CNN paper, except rather than taking your crops and passing them individually, each one of those 2000 crops um, through the CNN, you just project where those crops are down to the final layer on the, the final features map that's output from your CNN, and then you go from there. And after that point, it's essentially the same as region CNN. And this is going to be way faster because you don't have to have all these independent forward passes through the ComNet, like through the you know 101 layers or whatever that might be there. Um, it's gonna be a lot faster. And so essentially you just, you know, um, you, you know, you remove the final head from that and then you, um, you your images out of that last layer and then pass them forward. Um, and so there's something called region of interest pooling, um, which is just that, you know, as we've seen, you know, before, um, the fully connected layers um, are going to require like a fixed um, input size. Um, and so depending on the resolution of your original image, that will change the resolution of the layers really want to predict the class and want to predict the regression, that's gonna take however many pixels are kind of in that final layer um, uh, finer, finer, final features layer and like um, link those to the final outputs. And so you need a fixed size. And it just does this with something called region of interest pooling um, or ROI pooling. Um, and so essentially what they do is to just use an interpolation algorithm like bilinear to resize um, and then use max pooling, uh, which we've seen before. And so now you have these fixed size uh, crops um, that come out of your features map. Um, and so this kind of shows what this pipeline looks like in practice. And so you have this selective search that says like, oh, well, there might be an object where that red box is um, on the original image. You can just take that and project that down to the final layer of your ComNet. And then you're going to do the ROI pooling um, to get an output of the desired size to connect that um, to your classification head and your regression head that are gonna say what is in that crop, if anything, um, and how should the coordinates of that be adjusted? Okay. Um, and so essentially uh, the region-based uh, CNN just um, mimics the final stage of classification CNNs, um, where it's going to classify uh, the object and adjust the bounding box, um, just like we've seen before. And so essentially what we've done is turn this into a localization problem on each uh, region proposal. Um, and so how do we actually train this thing? Um, and um, so, First of all, um, we need to know what's an object and what's background. And so the way this is done in practice is you have some intersection over union threshold um, and any ground truth box uh, that has that is above that threshold gets assigned to the, you know, to be that object. Whereas if it's below that threshold, it's assigned to be background. Um, and then the targets for the bounding box regression are just the offset between the proposal 
in the corresponding ground truth box. And this is only calculated if there's actually an object, you know, and it's not classified as background because if it's classified as background, there's no object in that crop to detect. Um, and um, essentially uh, the idea is that you have, you know, you have these 2000 maybe different potential objects um, and you know whether they're foreground or background and you can take a, what's essentially a mini batch for training randomly sampled from that 2000 kind of potential objects within an image. Um, and so within every image that you're passing through this, you have multiple um, mini batches of crops uh, that you train that on. Um, and um, then at the end of this, there's a multitask loss, which is a weighted sum of classification and bounding box loss. Um, and for the bounding boxes, you only take into account the loss for the correct class. Okay. Um, and so obviously, um, you know, if you have 2000 kind of objects predicted in an image um, or, you know, however many you choose, you're going to get overlap between predictions. Um, and so we address this with something called non-maximum suppression, um, which takes the list of proposals sorted by um, the score, uh, the classification score, and it iterates over the sorted list, discarding those proposals that have an IOU larger than some predefined threshold. Um, and there's a, sorry, that, you know, so you essentially discard um, the, um, the objects that intersect other proposals with a higher score, where you're going to have to set some threshold that determines the level of intersection. And you have to be pretty careful when setting this threshold, um, because if you set it too low, um, so I'm going to drop anything that has an intersection over union above 0.3, um, with any object with a higher score, you're going to end up dropping uh, proposals that are actually for a separate object. Um, and you're going to miss objects altogether, uh, which is costly. But if you set this threshold too high, so say you wanted to have an overlap of greater than 0.9, um, then you'll end up with multiple proposals for the same object, um, which is also going to be problematic. Um, you know, if you're detecting a table, on the one hand, you would miss entire cells of the table altogether, whereas on the other hand, you would have duplicates of uh, certain cells. Um, and for our final list of objects, we can also set a score threshold. So, um, you know, we'll only accept objects with a classification score of over 0.7, something like that. You know, we remember using softmax, you have these scores between zero and one. Okay, so how do we evaluate um, how well we're doing on this? Um, to do that, um, we use a metric called mean average precision. And so mean average precision uh, penalizes you when you miss a box that you should have detected, as well as when you detect something that does not exist or detect the same thing multiple times. Um, and one thing I'll say is that in many papers in this literature, you'll see like, MAP in the range of like 0.5 or something, and people will argue that this is good. Um, but sort of in my experience with documents, it needs to be like at least 0.8, I would say. Obviously, that's going to depend on specific features of the image, how much padding you can do without overlapping other objects, etc. Um, but you know, I've sat there like having debate with like, you know, somebody with this computer science background who says, I don't see the problem. Like all these papers, they get an MAP score of like 0 0.5, 0 0.6. That's considered really good in this literature. And I'm like, this, this is my data. And like this just cut off like the leading digit of all these numbers. And so anything I do with this is going to be garbage. Yeah, but like in this literature, I'm like, I don't care about this literature. Like, you know, if you are trying to detect a cat and you like cut off like the edge of its tail, it maybe it doesn't matter. It's like still a cat. But if you're trying to detect numbers and documents and you cut off one of the digits, like that's kind of a big deal. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, that's just to say that like, we're gonna talk in the second half of this lecture about implementing all this stuff in practice, but you definitely need to like 
look carefully, you know, at your output and to get an intuition for how this kind of like translates. Uh, but I'd say above 0.8 is pretty good. And it's very difficult to get something like, and not even necessary per se, necessarily to get something, you know, all the way up to one. Um, and so let me just say a word about what the mean average precision is. So importantly, um, average precision is not the average of precision, which is a very important distinction. And I know it's like maybe um, confusing. And so like if you're familiar kind of with a lot of like um, prediction or CS papers, um, you'll know that precision is essentially um, the number of uh, true positives that you have divided by true positives plus false positives. Um, and so how many of the, um, the positives that you detect are actually true positives. Um, so suppose that mean average precision was just the average of precision. And look at this kind of example here. So the green is the ground truth um, and the red are the predictions. And this is trying to detect like pedestrians or cyclists or self-driving cars or whatever. Um, and so in this case, the number of true positives um, is one because it detects that one guy on a bicycle. And there's no false positives because it didn't put a red box anywhere that's not actually a person. And so the precision of this is one. Um, and so obviously if average precision was just the average of precision, that's going to be a problem because we've clearly made a bad mistake by failing to detect like that pedestrian um, in a crosswalk. Uh, but fortunately, that's not what average precision is. Um, and so in order to understand this, first we need to talk about intersection over union, which has come up before and it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's just the intersection um, of two objects divided by the union of those objects. Um, and um, so, um, Suppose that the, we have an IOU threshold of 0 0.5 and the IOU val value for a prediction is 0 0.7. And so the prediction has 0 0.7 overlap with the truth. Then we're gonna classify that prediction as a true positive. On the other hand, if the IOU is 0.3, we classify it as a false positive. And so what we call kind of true and false positive predictions is going to depend on this IOU threshold. Um, and recall how will you find true positives? Oh, oh, sorry. So like before we kind of talk about what, what um, average precision actually is, in addition to talking about precision, um, we need to talk about what recall is. Um, and so the term recall is how well you're finding the true positives. Remember precision is how many of your positives are actually true positives, whereas recall is how well you find true positive. So it's just true positive over true positive plus false negative. Um, and um, so as you can guess, there's like obviously gonna be like a trade-off, you know, potentially between these two things, which is kind of just true more generally. Like we talk about precision and recall and kind of things like medical testing and all sorts of, um, all sorts of different um, applications. Um, and so suppose we have a data set in it um, that has uh, five apples and there are 10 predictions um, and um, we rank them um, in order um, of their scores and um, we see for each one whether it's true or false. Um, and um, so remember that precision is the proportion of um, true positives that, uh, of predicted positives that are true. And so as you go through this list, you see, okay, you've only looked at one prediction and it actually is a true positive, precision is one. You look at another, it's a true positive, precision stays one. Oh, but the third thing that you look at going through the list um, is actually a false, a false positive. And so now your precision falls to 0.67. The second, the, the fourth one is also a false positive, falls to 0 0.5. This, the fifth one is false positive, it falls further. Then you have some true positives, it goes back up. And so this precision rate is kind of essentially um, moving around non-monotonically. Um, 
Whereas the recall rate is just going to be the share of the true positives that you found. So the first one, remember there's five true positives in all. So you look at the first one, that's a true positive. You found one, so 20%, the second one, 40%. And in this case, because we found kind of all the true positives among these 10 proposals, um, the recall is going to increase to one. And so average precision is just the area under the precision recall curve. Um, usually in practice, we would smooth this curve out. Um, and because precision and recall are both between zero and one, so is average precision. Um, and um, so essentially this is gonna be kind of like maximized when you're very good at finding the true positives and you're not finding uh, many of the many false positives along the way. Okay, so that's just a side note on um, how we evaluate um, how well we are doing at, um, um, at detection. Um, and so I want to come back now to fast RCNN. And so recall it solved, you know, it solved part of the problem um, with just the original RCNN paper. Um, it's much, much faster to train. Um, what you see on the left. Uh, the thing in the middle, SPPNet, is just kind of a modification on RCNN that we're not going to talk about. Um, but so it, the training time falls dramatically. Um, and then if you look at test time, um, so how fast it is just to estimate the model on uh, unseen data, um, you can see that it's much, much faster. So remember our CNN took like forever at test time because you were running each of these, you know, 2000 crops separately through the CNN. Essentially fast our CNN solves that um, by now just projecting the proposal through the CNN and taking the crop from the final features map that's output from the CNN. But the problem that you see here on the right is that Doing that selective search to get those region proposals just dominates runtime um, when you're trying to do model inference. Um, and so essentially it takes 10 times longer to run the selective search to get those object proposals than it takes um, to, do the, um, to do the predictions of the um, object class and bounding box. And so this is still kind of like, you know, it's a lot better um, than how long um, it took with just the original RCNN, but it, it's still kind of a problem. Okay, and so, you know, maybe not surprisingly, the authors solved this problem with a paper that they call uh, Faster RCNN. Um, and um, so the problem with Fast RCNN is that the selective search to get those object proposals on the original image is not actually fast. This is just some like kind of traditional computer vision pre-deep learning based approach. And it takes a couple of seconds per image. So it's just, it's pretty slow. Um, and so their innovation is to integrate a region proposal network as a learnable part of the model uh, following the convolutional backbone. And so rather than doing this kind of like, um, non-deep learning stuff at the beginning on the original image, they're going to estimate the region proposals, again, reusing that features map that is output um, from, uh, from the CNN. Um, and um, so the region proposal networks uh, uses a sliding window over the feature maps to get relevant anchor uh, boxes, which are just fixed size bounding boxes of various sizes that are placed throughout the image or placed throughout the features map and represent approximate bounding box predictions. Um, and this region proposal network has a binary classification for whether the bounding box has an object in it, background or foreground, and a regression head to refine the bounding box. Um, and it's going to classify whether or not the box has an object by just looking at the uh, intersection over union with the ground truth for that region. Um, and so essentially, like, again, you're, you're taking kind of this sliding window 
Um, but rather than doing that on the original image where you have to pass all the crops independently through the CNN, you're running this sliding window around on the final features map that is output by that CNN. So you don't have to make multiple kind of costly passes uh, through uh, the CNN. Um, and then you're gonna, use, you're gonna use deep learning. You're gonna have learnable weights um, rather than using this kind of pre-deep learning method um, to figure out what the regions of interest are. You're gonna have these proposals and there'll be a network with learnable weights um, that learns, is that an object? or is that not an object? And at this stage, you're not concerned with what kind of object is in that crop. You just wanna say, is there even an object there or does this just look like um, a background class? And so this is what the network looks like. And so you have your image. Um, you don't do anything now. You don't do anything to start with on the image. You just take the, the image and you pass it through the CNN and uh, that's gonna give you a features map. Um, and then, you're sliding around these kind of sliding windows um, for your region proposal network. And for each proposed region, um, you're gonna have a classification loss and a bounding box loss um, that tell you object, not object, um, and how to adjust the coordinates of that proposal um, to, um, to refine that bounding box. And so essentially, this again looks like localization and the only difference here is you're not yet concerned um, with uh, what type of, of object that is. Um, you just wanna know, is there an object or not? And then once you have that, you take all the ones that are objects and you adjust their coordinates using this bounding box regression loss. And then you do ROI pooling. So you're getting it in the constant size that the final layer needs um, because you have these different size crops and you're going to convert them all to the same size. Um, and then once you do that, you're going to have run another classifier and another bounding box regression loss. And so the other classifier is going to say specifically what object is it? Is it a cat, a dog, a plane, a car, whatever? Um, you know, in the case of our object, is this like um, a number? Is this text? You know, uh, what, whatever your classes are. Um, and um, and then you're also gonna have another bounding box regression loss. Um, and so this has significant computational savings because you're just using the comm features map for everything. And so you've already kind of extracted relevant information about out of your image and then you're just using that to do everything rather than having this kind of external um, search for object proposals. Um, and so, um, Remember that sort of what a calm net does is it takes your image and it's passing it down and um, the uh, you're running it through these kind of stride filters, say like a stride two filter. And so the spatial resolution is decreasing while the depth increases. And so um, on your features map, you have these anchors and each time you slide them over one pixel. Um, but you also have this down sample rate between the dimensions of your original image and the dimensions of the output. And so in VGG, for example, this ratio is 16. And so basically, um, if you're sliding your anchor over one pixel in the final features map, it's like you're sliding it over 16 pixels um, in the original image. And then around each of these anchors, you have different bounding boxes um, for region proposals. Um, and um, so um, usually we set as you know a set of pixels. So we might, depending on, and this is going to depend on the size of your image, but they might be like you know 64 pixels and high at 128, 256, and then we set um, aspect ratios between the width and the height of the boxes. Um, and so in the faster RCNN paper, there's nine bounding boxes, which is just kind of the product between the uh, three sizes and the three aspect ratios. Um, in practice, these anchor boxes are hyperparameters um, that need to be set appropriately. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but this is kind of, uh, you know, an, an example of that. And so here you can see there's the, you know, the anchor is the center point and there's nine different, you know, boxes potentially that you've drawn around the anchor that depend on their, um, on the like, uh, uh, longest edge of the box and the aspect ratio 
Um, and then you see kind of the anchor points in the middle image. And then that's what the anchor boxes look like on the right. And in practice, if the anchor boxes go off the edge of the image, they get dropped, right? And so you're kind of moving these anchors across, but if the anchor is going, if the recently box is going off the uh, edge of the image, you get rid of that. And then those are, um, then you're gonna send those and you're gonna say in this box, is there an object? And how should I adjust the coordinates of this box? And again, you're supervising that with the ground truth because you have labeled data and you know whether there's actually an object in that anchor box. Um, and you know how much you need to move that original proposal around um, to um, get congruence um, with the actual object coordinates. Okay, and so in terms of how we actually implement this, um, essentially it starts with a three by three convolutional layer. Um, and then you have um, these um, one by one convolutions um, that collapse it um, to um, the number of dimensions that you need for your fully connected layer. Um, and um, so essentially the three by three conv is performing this kind of additional convolution. And then, um, you know, for the class, remember it's just object, no object. Um, and so we need two K um, output channels where K is the number of anchors. And for each proposal, um, K, um, we need 4K um, uh, channels um, for, the, um, for the coordinate um, regression because there's four coordinates. And so this is just essentially you're using these convolutions to get these region proposals to be the number of dimensions that you need to hook it up with your object, not object classifier and your bounding box regression. Um, and then, um, you know, essentially um, from this point on, now you know if something's an object or not an object, and then just the rest of it is the same um, as fast RCNN. Um, and um, so in terms of how to train the region proposal network, so for training, we take all the anchors and put them into two different categories uh, based on whether they have significant overlap or minimal overlap with the ground truth. So foreground, foreground and background. Um, and then we randomly sample these anchors to form a mini batch size. And usually that's of 256, um, maintaining a balanced ratio between background and foreground anchor. So again, kind of within every image, um, you're going to sample this mini batch because essentially within every image, there's these mini um, cropped images, but you're now you're taking that crop um, from um, from the final layer of your convolutional features map. Um, and you use all anchors from the mini batch to calculate the classification loss using cross entropy. And you use only mini batch anchors classified as foreground to calculate the regression loss uh, using the foreground um, anchor uh, boxes and comparing those to the ground truth boxes. Okay, and just as before, because you can essentially see this is kind of this, this is a localization problem, right, again, but now instead of, we, just the only difference is, instead of saying specifically what category it is, there's only two options, like foreground or background. Um, so again, anchors are going to overlap. You need to drop some of those with non-maximum suppression, and you'll keep the top end proposal sorted by score. Um, and again, pay attention to that parameter because obviously how many of those proposals you want to keep is going to like depend on the number of objects that tend to be in your image. So if some reason you're like recognizing like cats and there tend to be only two cats in an image, that parameter is going to need to be different than if you're digitizing tables and you have hundreds of objects uh, within each image. Okay. And then, yeah, the rest of the model, once you have this region proposal network, is just fast RCNN. Um, you do ROI pooling and then you have the same kind of layers at the end as fast RCNN. And that additional kind of bounding box layer at the end is working as this refinement um, to the previous kind of bounding boxes, which are themselves a refinement to the anchor boxes. Um, 
And it's been shown that joint training leads to better results, although that's not what they did in the original paper. And so essentially, again, you have this multitask loss, um, but now rather than there just being two losses, you have four losses because now the region proposal is itself something that's estimated from the data. Um, and so you have the uh, classification and regression loss from the region proposal network and the classification and the regression loss from the RCNN um, kind of uh, final layer. Um, and then you also have the backbone, which you can choose to fine tune or not. Um, and uh, the four different losses are combined uh, using, using a weighted sum into a multitask loss. And you can also do things like add regularization to the RPN or to the RCNN and potentially even to the backbone. Okay, so this is speed like at test time. So when you're doing inference on unseen data and you can remember RCNN is very slow. It took 49 seconds. Fast RCNN takes 2.3 seconds and how faster RCNN is down to 0.2 seconds. And again, I mean, obviously this is gonna depend on what machine you're using, but the key thing is it's like way, 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 way faster to do it this way um, because, and accuracy is actually, you know, getting better. Um, and so you're not losing anything. You're just really leveraging kind of an understanding of the network and of the fact that because convolutions are this kind of spatial thing, you don't need to pass every image crop through independently. You can just get that information um, out of the, the final level of the features map. Okay, so there's one more thing that we need to say um, on object detection. Um, and um, that is about features pyramids, um, which is something that's not in the original faster RCNN paper, but it, it is actually important and improves performance. Um, and so this idea has a long kind of history in computer vision. Um, and so the first thing it is, so just to kind of step back more broadly, um, the challenge here is that in, in the image, you may have objects of very, very different scales, you know, so you could have like, you know, an elephant and a mouse, um, you know, in documents, you might have objects of, of, of very, very different scales. You have a newspaper article and then a byline. Um, and, um, and, so like ideally it would be most efficient to like extract these objects of different scales from different sizes of images. And so kind of a very old idea um, in, the, um, in the literature is this idea of a featureized image pyramid where you just have an image and then you scale it down um, and um, you can run all of those through the standard separately. And for exactly the reasons we've just talked about, you don't want to do that because it's costly to run images through the CNN. And this is something that people mostly did in the days like before deep learning, um, where whatever they like kind of the rule based methods they were using to extract features from images like, um, you know, worked best in this way. Um, but this is not something you would ever do now. Um, so far, um, the, the things that the, the, the work that we have discussed uses a single features map. Um, so, you know, remember, like in, in the papers that we just discussed, you take that final layer of the ComNet and you do your region proposal network on it, or you project your region proposals from the raw image through that layer. Um, and this is kind of, you know, then up until this paper, this was like the norm. Um, but this makes it hard to recognize objects of different skills, and it makes it particularly hard to recognize small objects. Um, and that, by the way, is going to be a big problem with documents, um, which tend to have way more objects and they tend to be smaller than in a natural image. Okay, and so um, one idea which kind of like comes in part from the papers that we've just seen is that you could reuse the pyramidal features hierarchy from the ComNet. So remember that a way a convolutional neural network works is that your first layer is extracting these really kind of low level features from pixels. Like it's trying to detect things like edges. Um, and then as you go down, you're kind of, you're taking those edges and saying, well, can we detect these higher level features from the edges? And can we detect even higher level features from those intermediate features? 
Um, and as you go down, you, you're, you're down sampling the image. Um, and so basically at the first layer, say of your ComNet, you have very high resolution image, like in the like width and height dimension, but it's going to be very weak at extracting features because you haven't passed it through all these layers yet. It's just going to mostly have information about say where edges are, but it's not going to have information about you know where your objects are. Um, and once you kind of pass it all the way through the ComNet, um, you have strong like semantic information about kind of what the features are in your image, but it's low resolution. Um, and so the idea is like, well, maybe we could do our sort of like our region proposal network, you know, on each of these kind of on each of these layers um, from the ComNet, um, but you don't actually want to do that um, for, you know, because it's not going to work well with those higher resolution layers because those contain information about the low level features and not about the kind of higher level features in the image. Um, and so the insight here is something called like a features pyramid network uh, in this paper by Lynn et al. Um, and so essentially what it does is kind of very similar and foreshadowed um, by what we saw with semantic segmentation where you can essentially like kind of stack the ComNet in reverse and upsample uh, the final layer from your ComNet that has that kind of that rich information about the features in your data, um, but that is um, that is much um, uh, lower resolution. Um, and in practice, the way they do this is um, you know they're doing um, some upsampling, but they also have these lateral connections that are kind of trying to um, preserve some of the information that you lost through downsampling. So you're like upsampling the last layer of your features network, but you're kind of disciplining that with some of the information that's in the layers of equivalent re resolution that have those kind of lower level features. So you need like those lateral connections. And if you go to the paper, it shows you that if you don't have those lateral connections, it doesn't work so well. Um, and so in practice, um, when you apply this today, the, the bottom up pathway, so the, the first pass is ResNet and it's just like ResNet, like exactly what we saw. Um, and it consists of many convolutional layers. So, you know, 50 or 101 convolutional layers. Um, and, you know, that's divided into kind of these five different um, resolutions. And as we move up, the spatial resolution is, is reduced by one half, um, uh, you know, by, by doubling the stride. Um, and so in the top down pathway where we're taking this kind of low resolution, but high information kind of um, final output of the um, first pass through the ComNet, we upsample it. Um, they use nearest neighbors. Um, and um, the issue is that uh, because of the downsampling and upsampling, sometimes it's not very kind of precise where objects end up because you've lost information in downsampling. And that's going to be a problem if you're predicting coordinates for bounding boxes. And so you have these lateral connections. And so you're getting kind of like the features information, like from the final layer of the ComNet. Um, but um, you're getting some of that kind of specific location information from the lateral connections. Um, and um, and you use the one by one convolutions to make it the same depth. Re remember that like one by one convolutions are a tool for changing the depth of a features map. And so in this case, since the final depth from resident is 256, um, but that's changing as you move through the network, you're taking these kind of layers um, from the, um, the uh, bottom up pass and you're converting them to the same depth with these one by one convolutions that are kind of connecting across the lateral layers. Um, and so, you know, this is an example kind of of what that looks like um, in practice. And so remember the original faster RCNN that we just saw look like this. You have an image, you pass it, say, through ResNet, you know, you're getting um, essentially an, like rich information, but it's downsampled. Um, 
And uh, then you have this region proposal network, you have the proposed regions, you crop them out of the image, you pass it to ROI pooling, um, and then you have the kind of final um, bounding box um, in class predictions. Well, when you integrate the, um, uh, the, the features pyramid network, it's essentially very similar, um, but now essentially um, you're taking that final layer and you're upscaling that using the method that we just saw. And then you have your region proposal network um, and which one of the images you crop from is gonna depend on the width and the height of your region of interest. And so you're gonna get you know, the small objects from the higher resolution um, layer and you're gonna get the larger objects from the lower resolution layer. And it can be shown that this improves performance um, in practice. And so if you go and implement this today, you know, in practice, you're gonna to wanna to turn on the parameter um, that, that, that controls the features permit network. Okay, so that's object detection. Um, and I know it's kind of a lot to take in. If we have time kind of next week, I'll try to do some, um, provide some information on kind of visualizing what you get out of the dif different layers of the ConvNet, because I think it might help all of this to kind of make a little bit more sense. Um, but hopefully this gives you guys a, at least a, a, a general sense of what's going on underneath the hood when you run an object detection model. Okay, so now I'm gonna just briefly say something about object segmentation. Um, and so object segmentation is where you're detecting objects, but instead of detecting a box with four coordinates around them, you have a pixel by pixel classification of whether or not that pixel is a given, uh, is a given object. So you see in this example, there's the different people standing around a table and each person is a separate object. Whereas in semantic segmentation, like all people would just be the people class. Okay, and so the successor, again, kind of by a, the similar set of authors to faster RCNN is mask RCNN, uh, which essentially just adds another fully connected branch to faster RCNN to predict masks. Um, and so now instead of these four losses, you have a fifth loss, um, which is predicting your mask. And so it, it's essentially all you're doing is having a semantic segmentation problem inside each region proposal. So because inside each region proposal, there's only one object, um, then this is like the same way that kind of like we broke um, localization, you know, we turned multiple, uh, we turned object detection into a localization problem with these region proposals. Uh, we turn um, object segmentation or instance segmentation into semantic segmentation again with the region proposals. Um, and um, so the mask loss is just computed by taking the cross entropy loss between the predicted mask and the ground truth um, for each pixel. Um, mask RCNN also incorporated the feature pyramid networks that we just saw. They slightly modified the ROI pooling, but I think that that's not too important for our purposes. They just needed to make that a little bit more precise because when you're predicting pixel by pixel, you can you care a lot about the precise boundaries. Um, and they trained this on um, a Microsoft Cocoa data set. Um, and so this is just kind of a sketch of this architecture. So you see the image, you pass it through ResNet, you have your region proposal and practice that's going to be done um, you know, um, with the features pyramid network that we saw that is kind of sampling, upsampling uh, that final layer of ResNet. Um, you do your ROI pooling, which in this paper is called ROI align. And then you have, um, you know, your fully connected layer um, to predict the bounding boxes in their class. And then you have another um, convolutional network um, that's going to predict a mask. Um, where it's a pixel by pixel classification loss. And so this part is just like putting the semantic segmentation we already saw. And again, like essentially neural networks are Legos and you can just stack it on and then you can have a multi-class loss and you just add up the five different losses and you're weighting them somehow and that is what you are minimizing. Okay, so that is segmentation. And I just wanna say a final word on other frameworks 
So the other framework that you'll hear people talk about is called YOLO for you only look once. Um, and it essentially treats object detection as a regression problem. Um, and so with, you know, you have these essentially um, grids of the image that you place anchors on, and then you slide the anchors across. Um, and you're just um, for each region proposal, you're predicting what object it is or whether it's background. Um, and you're uh, predicting an offset to that bounding box. Um, and so essentially what this is, or like, which is also called like single shot detector. The reason they say you only look once or it's single shot is this is essentially just the region proposal part of faster RCNN. Um, so remember in faster RCNN, you have the region proposal where you say object, no object, and you adjust the coordinates of that box. And then you pass it through again to another set of fully convolutional layers where you say, what kind of object is this? And you refine the box again. So there's kind of this, this you're looking at that region proposal twice, whereas with you only look once, um, and the kind of the first pass, instead of saying object, no object, um, you say like what object it is, is it a cat or a car or a bird or whatever, a newspaper article, and you adjust the coordinates and that's it. Um, and so intuitively, like this is faster um, because um, you're only looking at the image once, um, but the accuracy is not as high. Um, in, in our experience, it was just not really usable on documents. Um, and so this essentially like, you know, cost me a lot of effort because I was working with some like CS students um, and they're like, oh yeah, we should use kind of YOLO. That's like the big thing people use, it's fast and then it wasn't very good. And so we're like, oh, maybe this like object detection doesn't work so well for documents without like way more labels than we can produce. Maybe we should try some more rule-based methods. Um, but essentially at the end of the day, like mask our CNN is like enough better that like in our experience it worked for a number of labels that was reasonably reasonable to produce and while compute is costly like human labor is way more costly so i would rather get that increased accuracy through the fact that you know mask our cnn has this kind of um, more involved architecture than through having to give yolo more labels and so we just didn't find this useful but i guess you know depending on what you're doing maybe it is good enough for what you're doing um but you know it, it ties into the point that i mentioned earlier which is errors in object detection on like tables can be catastrophic because you cut off a digit of a number and it's just that it's it totally screws everything up um and so really the extra accuracy that you can squeeze out of mask our cnn in my opinion is, is worth it being a little slower and more costly um, and so now we want to give you um, a sense of how you would actually implement object detection models in practice. Um, and this is based on our experience, uh, largely um, Jake's experience, who did a great job putting together these slides, and the experience of another student that I've been working with on actually um, applying object detection to uh, real world social science problems. Okay. Um, all right, so the first thing that ties in very closely uh, to what we were just talking about is uh, what object detection model do you wanna use? I just told you not to use YOLO, um, but what about you know between the ones that we just saw? Um, we just talked about how mask our CNN um, is essentially, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's faster our CNN, but it has this mask head to it. Um, and um, you might say like, well, I should just use faster RCNN because masks are irrelevant to what I'm doing. So for example, what we're doing, detecting layouts of newspapers or tables, like the objects we wanna detect are boxes to start with. And so like um, the mask part is, um, is essentially irrelevant. And like we create masks just by calling like every pixel within that box, the mask, right? And so like, it's not like we care about predicting the mass, so we're going to use them. Um, but um, actually, um, you don't want to turn off the mass gloss um, just because um, the mass gloss is giving you an additional set of weights and it actually improves performance. Um, 
And um, so um, you see that in this paper here, where even just, you know, sheerly on predicting the boxes, mask our CNN um, performs better. Um, and so we, you want to use mask our CNN, not fast or CNN, even if you don't care about the boxes, because just having that additional set of weights is going to probably give you a performance boost. Okay. All right. Um, so yep, take takeaway is use mask our CNN. Um, and the very good news is that um, there is very functional, very well developed code for using mask our CNN. Um, and, you know, I should say that there's also some kind of newer successors to mask our CNN besides YOLO that like I didn't talk about. Um, and we did experiment with those two. Um, and they will claim in their papers to get like better performance on, you know, this benchmark or whatever the mask our CNN. But on our data set, like they were actually worse and it was a huge pain to implement them because they didn't have very good code behind them. Um, Whereas as we'll see, mask our CNN, you can implement it with code from Facebook AI research, which is just fantastic. It will save you a lot of headache and it probably is like gonna be the best model anyways, because it's been so extensively studied. Okay, um, and so in order to implement uh, mask our CNN, you're gonna need Detectron 2. Um, which is a PyTorch fueled um, Facebook AI research software system that implements state of the art object detection models. Um, and so, practically speaking, that means that um, Detectron 2 is a code base for object detection uh, that's accessible uh, via a GitHub repository. Um, and um, so, I will make an aside here that. Um, there's a lot of code out there for doing deep learning stuff that's buggy and just doesn't work. Um, whereas, um, you know, if you're doing kind of vision stuff as well as some NLP stuff, like Facebook AI research, like their code just kind of like blows everybody else out of the water. It just, it works out of the box. It does useful things. You know, when we get to NLP, we'll see that hugging face is very similar for NLP, but like Facebook AI research actually has some pretty good code for NLP too. And so, you know, whatever you're doing, it's good. It's a good um, first stop shop to see like whether they have code that will do it. Um, and you'll probably save yourself a lot of effort. Okay. And so you can do a lot of different things in Detectron 2, um, but for our purposes, we're going to talk about object detection and has pretty good documentation. So now that you're familiar with it, you can go look up in the documentation and do kind of um, whatever you want. Uh, but we're going to talk about object detection, which I think is the most common task that we would use it for. Okay. And so essentially, Detectron 2 can be seen as a wrapper uh, for a huge number of object detection model training and testing functions. Um, and so you can imagine at a high level that it's essentially a function that requires three inputs. You need your input images. Um, you need a model checkpoint file, which is save weights from previous training. Um, how are you going to initialize the model? And then you need a configuration file it sets all your hyperparameters. And with those three inputs, you're going to produce an output. So if you're training the model, that's going to be a new set of model weights. Um, if, you're if you're testing, if you're doing model inference, um, that's going to be bounding boxes and classes for all objects detected in your image. Um, and um, so we're going to be talking today about using it for fine tuning by which we mean we start the process of training a model from an existing checkpoint um, from you know, a model weight initialization that either you arrived at previously or someone else arrived at previously. Like, so um, for our purposes, you'll want to access Detectron 2 um, by cloning their GitHub uh, repository onto your machine and then installing from the source code. Um, 
And um, so this will enable you to run various scripts from the command line and give you access to the API in Python. Um, so you see the code here. Um, alternatively, you may want to install a Docker container that has the Tektron 2 in it, and they make that available. Um, so you would need to learn some about Docker. Um, the return is that you get a containerized environment, um, which means dependency management is taken care of. So in practice, dependency is a huge issue with this. Um, and so if you go and download a new version of Detectron 2, all of the dependencies will break. And you're going to have to update a bunch of other stuff on your machine to make it work with the new Detectron 2. And in general, like dependency management is just kind of like a headache. Um, when doing deep learning, uh, because this, this world is moving really fast, things get updated all the time, you kind of take care of that. It's also helpful for collaboration. So let's say you have a collaborator and you're both working on this. Um, you know, you might have huge dependency issues because they have different things installed on their machine and then their code won't work on your machine. And so Docker, Docker containers help with that. But there is a cost and especially like Docker containers on a Mac is, is a problem because there's all this memory leak and Docker says it's Mac's fault, the Mac says it's Docker's fault, I think essentially, and nobody's gonna fix this. Um, and so it really has a cost, um, but even on other machines, it may leave a non-trivial memory footprint. And so I just encourage you to be aware of this um, and try to figure out kind of um, what's gonna work best for your needs and your collaboration needs and whether or not Docker is the way to go or not. Um, there's also a pre-built from source code versions for Linux, um, which is gonna make your life easier to install if you're using it on a Linux machine. Um, and um, so another note here that you will see come up. Um, and so you can run this code on a CPU and depending on what you wanna do, it may be fine. Obviously it's gonna be way slower on a CPU. I mean, you would probably in practice do inference always on a CPU, you don't need an expensive GPU to test, um, but to train the model, you know, you're, you're estimating a lot of parameters and a GPU is gonna be much faster, um, but you know, if you don't have it, you can run it on a CPU and just try to do something, you know, definitely use transfer learning, um, you know, and, and be patient, I would say. Um, but if you are able to run it on a GPU, um, you're going to need to be, um, you know, have, know what CUDA is, which is the NVIDIA authored framework for GPU computation. Um, and it allows you to do like multi-processing across multiple GPUs. You're gonna need to have it configured. Um, if you wanna use your GPU with PyTorch or any other kind of ML application. Um, Another aside here is that if you are thinking about purchasing a GPU, um, NVIDIA GPUs are uh, sort of by far and away um, the most well-developed and supported. Um, so you'll probably want an NVIDIA GPU. Uh, the downside is that they kind of have a monopoly and so they're super buggy and like they just don't have as much competition as would be ideal, but that's kind of like early adopter pains. Um, and so that's kind of like what I have to say on installation. They have very clear installation instructions and troubleshooting instructions. Okay, so we are out of time for today, um, but I'm gonna pick up here Monday and I, I believe Monday will also talk about um, active learning, which is gonna make your life a lot easier, hopefully for labeling, because this is all heavily supervised. You're not gonna get around needing labeled data. And so how can you construct it cheaply? So it's another kind of very kind of uh, practical lecture. All right, I'll see you guys on Monday.